On behalf of the College of Social Work, I want to say my thanks to the, Col the Columbus City Council, to our researchers, our advocates, our community members, the local stakeholders, and policymakers who've all contributed to better understanding immigrant experiences. To our council member, our sincerest appreciation for your leadership, continued involvement, and trust in our college to complete this research. The project is a great example of our strong belief in the transformative power of knowledge and a commitment to constructing a society where every member counts and every member can contribute and flourish. This Columbus City Council's commitment to the well-being of our immigrant members serves as a model for other communities aspiring to embrace inclusion. As we, explore, as we in, explore the insights presented tonight, we will learn about perspectives and analyses that underscore a commitment to diverse immigrant inclusion. The knowledge gained from this study will undoubtedly shape policies, programs, and strategies, ensuring that our region remains a supportive home for everyone. In conclusion, I think I, think I speak for many of us that I hope this work continues with more dialogue, policy de development, and community action on this important topic. Thank you. I'll now hand off to our council member. Thank you. Well, hello, good evening, everyone. Buenas tardes. Uh, you know, I'm not usually one to have written remarks. I usually, uh, for those of you who have seen me speak, I usually say that, uh, speak from the heart. But um, I also, if you know me, then you know I'm a little emotional sometimes. So I find that written uh, remarks usually help with that. And I was going to say, um, I, I as I walked in here today, it's been a long day. It's uh, it, it, we had a, a challenging council meeting yesterday, and um, walking in here felt like I was in community and felt like I was in family. That for so many of you, for many years, whether we've worked together before I came on to city council or as I've been on city council and you've been partners in this work, um, I definitely walked into this space feeling like um, we were together and very excited about the future and the work that we will do together. So, uh, so first I want to start off by saying happy Immigrant Heritage Month. This is our month, happy Caribbean Heritage Month. See, for some of us, I always say, uh, you know, we get these months throughout the year where you get to celebrate whatever identity you are. And some of us are lucky enough to get two or three or multiple months. When for us, it's a 365, 24-7 proposition, we're just inviting other people to the party. But I'm one to celebrate, so I'm going to celebrate all the things. So um, here's to us. Um, you know, this, uh, this country is a nation of immigrants whose hopes and dreams helped found this country and continues to push us forward today. The city of Columbus is the 14th largest city in the country and growing. Currently 10%, 10 of the city's residents are foreign born and this number is expected to continue to rise. Columbus is expected to grow by 1 million people and actually projections are looking more like doubling or tripling the size of our population by 2050. And we are probably on track to actually exceed that and, and do that before 2050. And is the, and the leading contributor uh, factor behind our population growth in central Ohio is? That's correct. It is us. It is immigrants and refugees who are coming to Columbus and making this their home. Our immigrant and refugee communities are vibrant and vital to the city of Columbus and the state of Ohio. Collectively, immigrant communities contributed $353 million to state and local taxes. Immigrants are resilient innovators and organic entrepreneurs. They contribute to the culture of our city through food and music and art. They are representative of our growing workforce in literally every sector. And we have long seen the impact in our historic neighborhoods, like German Village, uh, Italian Village, and Hungarian Village. And we see the modern day impact in every, literally 
every part of the city as the African, Middle Eastern, Asian, and Latino diaspora continues to grow. When my parents decided to come to make Columbus their home shortly after coming to the United States in the 70s, they could not have dreamed of the city that we are today. Their native tongue can be heard on the radio, on TV. Uh, no longer when we meet one Latino, we exchange numbers because there's many of us now. Or that there would be many options where they could buy plantains or black beans. But as thousands have resettled and continue to resettle here in Columbus, they often face barriers and are unable to access resources. And we've seen this over and over again, that the issues that our city is facing is not just with the residents that have been here, but their residents that continue to come here. I would point us to Colonial Village. I would point us to Riverview. We have an obligation as a city to ensure, to ensure that everyone feels safe and respected. We can not only celebrate our immigrant heritage, we have to defend it. We must ensure that hate has no safe harbor and that we allow no gaps in prosperity for any of our residents. When I came in, see, there you go. When I came into office, I knew that our immigrant, migrant, and refugee community, a community that I am so proud to be a part of, would be one of my main priorities. But the work uh, needs to be rooted in community. And that is how the partnership with the OSU College of Social Work, uh, we launched the Immigrants Make Columbus Project through town halls and round tables and a super innovative photo documentation project, we were able to connect with so many immigrants, refugees, and migrants here in Columbus. The research included over 100 participants from across the diaspora and importantly, the voice of our young people. When we started this process, an idea started to form in my office to more deeply engage the community. And I'm excited to share that officially, uh, we are officially announcing here today the Columbus Commission on Immigrant and Refugee Affairs held within the city of Columbus. <laughs> this summer, we will hold public hearings where we'll share the structure and the mission of the commission with public input. That means that all of you should come, you should share your ideas, you should give us feedback. And after the period of public input, we hope to present the legislation to the Columbus City Council in September so that we can officially codify the commission with a commission launching in January of 2025. Um, I am there, I got a sneak peek at the um, information that you're about to see tonight and I'm eager to hear, uh, for you all to hear the suggestions from the city that will help to move our, for, our work forward as a city. I wanna thank our partners at OSU. I wanna thank the incredible team uh, led by Arati who um, was intentional about this work, who cares about this work because they saw themselves in this work. Um, I also want to ensure that I thank uh, tonight's panelists, all who I am so proud to say that they have uh, become friends and advisors. Um, and I want to thank my staff, Amaris Lamus, who is here, Jessica Casares, who put all of her heart into this work and unfortunately could not be here uh, with us this evening. Um, she's with her family, but I know that she's probably watching or will be watching. Um, and lastly, I want to thank all of you. Uh, many of you were part of our town halls, coming multiple times uh, to all of the town halls and participating, lending your voice, lending your stories. Uh, but I want to especially thank you for the work that each of you do every day. Uh, there are many of you that I can point to in this community that you do not just lead an organization, you do not just lead an effort, you do not just show up for town halls, but you are true advocates for the communities both that you represent and who we all represent collectively. And for that, you make our city better. You are quite literally the best of us. So thank you for being here tonight. And with that, I turn the floor over to Arati.
Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us this evening. My name is Ariti Moleku, Associate Professor at the College of Social Work at The Ohio State University. And on behalf of our research team, I'm here and very excited to share the first round of findings from the Immigrant Make Columbus Project. And before we begin, I'd like to make a land and labor acknowledgement, acknowledging that we benefit from the indigenous lands on which we live, teach, and practice social work and honor the indigenous peoples who have stewarded these lands. We hold sacred the labor of immigrants, often exploited, indentured, and underpaid, that built and continue to serve our institutions. We recognize the ties between higher education and the North Atlantic slave trade, and how profits from slavery helped found and shape college and university campuses and enslaved Africans built and served in these institutions. We honor the labor and resistance of these ancestors and recognize that it is our responsibility to work towards liberation for all. So the next 35 minutes or so, what we hope to do is to first provide a quick overview of the research project, data collection and analysis procedures, spend the majority of time um, sharing the findings of the research, and community recommendations. I will then open it up for discussions and will be happy to clarify anything or any, answer any questions that you may have. Um, there will also be note cards that could be passed around um, that should be available to you if you want to write your questions. And if we cannot cover that, I'll be happy to be in touch with you. I do want to mention our study was approved by the Office of Responsible Research at The Ohio State University, and all the photos um, used throughout the presentation, taken by our very own Stuart Blake. Um, and materials were all approved by respective participants. So let's start with the overview of the research project. The goal of our study was to garner a comprehensive understanding of a sense of belonging and inclusion among immigrant, refugee, and migrant communities in Columbus. Um, I'll be using the terms immigrants and refugees throughout just to encompass these categories of economic and forced migration, understanding there are some nuanced differences there. So this idea around concept of belonging, right, um, which is typically defined as these emotional challenges Im immigrants face in the process of social and cultural reorientation. Um, it's, it's important as it really influences the formation of social ties, participation in a community, and the overall well-being and quality of life, and ultimately the integration processes. Um, it also has a significant role in building a sense of community within a neighborhood, right? In, in across communities or groups, but the sense of belonging, as well as the challenges to the sense of belonging, have been a very understudied studied area, because if you think of, about it, it's pretty complicated, right? So why is this crucial for immigrant integration? We sort of know this, but we still cannot be able to define it in a clear sense. And I think the, the study has sort of brought in some of those insights from the community. And so when this successful immigrant integration is a goal for many host communities, it is becoming a major policy issue, um, largely, again, due to the challenges of understanding and measuring the complexity of integration in itself. So when we think about integration, right, like let's think about integration and how we understand that. It's, it's but, uh, sort of understood as this degree to which immigrants have the knowledge and capacity to achieve success in the host society. And the sense of belonging experienced by the members of immigrant and refugee communities in their integration processes again, is not a very straightforward process. So as immigrants and refugees, you know, when they come to the United States, um, adapt to new surroundings, their health, well-being, education prospects, employment, access to services, everything changes, right? And that's really based on the social position. And while these can bring both new opportunities, it also brings new inequalities. So when we think about research and um, research that is done so far, research affirms that immigrant and refugee populations and this sense of eroded sense of belonging presents a major obstacle to 
um, integration and well-being. And belongingness really is the core to addressing social determinants of health. And so there's this need for this growing understanding around sense of belonging, how we can inform policies, how we can inform program initiatives, and so that immigrants full, uh, fully feel they're included in the economic, social, cultural, and political dimensions of the society. And that is the core um, content of our research. Now, there have been some significant studies done in the Central Ohio region that have provided insights on the growing diversity of the Central Ohio region. Council member um, very eloquently highlighted that. The success of, the, um, of refugees, right? The assessment of the human services landscape pertaining to immigrant and refugees that was done by our college, um, at the College of Social Work. And again, the five key areas of equitable workforce and economic development. And these studies have certainly highlighted the issues that impede immigrant and refugee integration. And we've built the lessons learned from these prior studies and few others to really focus on the role of sense of belonging, the emotional values, which is, again, a very understudied area, even when it comes to migration studies. So our research questions, um, we wanted to really look at the factors that contribute to the development of sense of belonging, right? Really exploring these multi-dimensional, uh, multiple dimensions and manifestations of these sense of belonging within the immigrant integration process. We wanted to understand the barriers and facilitators to this sense of belonging through diverse perspectives. Um, we were interested to examine the role of sense of belonging in the relationship between integration and quality of life um, and how this sort of plays out in the immigrant context. Um, also, we wanted to identify strategic priorities um, to recommend for program and policies from community-grounded solutions. And I should add, as researchers um, that hold community-engaged principles at the core of our research, we were also interested to see how we could advance the science of community-engaged research um, by establishing and really reinforcing these pathways through um, collaborative community academic partnerships. Now, very quickly, um, in, when it came to conceptualizing the research, we delved into the literature and created a conceptual framework uh, pertaining to the social determinants of immigrant and refugee inclusion in the post-migration context. We looked at the social determinants of health, and we looked at the integration framework that really looks into these markers and means social connections. The unique contribution here, though, is our approach to think about inclusion, a step beyond integration. Um, and immigrant integration and immigrant inclusion are sort of related concepts, but the focus on different aspects of immigrant experience. So immigrant integration really refers to this process uh, where immigrants can become full and active participants in the economic, social, cultural, political life. Uh, immigrant inclusion, on the other hand, refers to the deliberate efforts and policies that are aimed at ensuring that immigrants are welcomed, they are valued, they have equal opportunities to participate in all aspects of society. And so even in this larger discussion around immigrant integration, we wanted to take a step forward by understanding that sense of belonging, which could then contribute to understanding the larger inclusion space. And so in, in terms of research methodology, I just wanted to quickly um, share that we used a multi-level mixed methods research design. Young people sort of are not included in these conversations. It was very important for us to um, center their voices um, at the core of this research as well. So at level one, we, we talked to immigrant and refugee youth through the Photo Voice Project, where they use photography to talk about their lived experiences. And then level two, immigrant and refugee communities. Many of you participated in these town halls where we collected both qualitative data and um, survey data. And local stakeholders, a very important um, group where we held virtual focus group discussions. So guided by the community engagement principles, we started with the formation of the community advisory council that really helped us center our research in the community. Um, these council members guided us throughout the research process from conceptualization to data collection, understanding, interpreting the findings, as well as putting this event together today. So thank you so much. Um, quickly, you've seen this. You know, we 
did multiple recruitment strategies, had all these town halls around the city across different locations. Um, some of the stakeholders were very welcoming to host these at the libraries um, in the city as well. And you know, there was this overlapping four-tiered approach. Uh, we started with a kickoff event, the World Cafe discussion, where we wanted to sort of start this community conversation. What is it about your community that makes you feel like you belong, right? There were these information gathered at the kickoff event really informed the study as well. Um, what does your Columbus community feel like? Hopeful, but lonely, uncertain, and disconnected. But there was just a lot of these rich insights that informed the research as well. So I'm going to go through data collection. So in terms of data collection, there were three facets. First, we had the community survey data. Um, then we had community focus group discussions in those town halls. And people, this is called identical sampling, so people that participated in the um, community survey also participated in the um, focus group discussion, so we could get both quantitative and qualitative data. We had focus group um, discussions with the stakeholders that were conducted virtually, and then photo voice sessions with young people, and we had 109 participants from the community, 19 participants in the stakeholders, and 16 photo voice participants. So in terms of the community town hall, so I'm gonna walk us through each of these aspects. Um, in terms of community town halls where our community participated, this was a geographic representation. As you can see here, all these zip codes of participants, and that is overlaid with the sense of tract information which shows a very good representation, uh, particularly from Franklin County. In terms of demographic characteristics of our community sample, the 109 sample participants represented 23 countries of origin. Um, by region of birth, 31.1% from Africa, 476 from Asia, 13.6% um, from Central and Latin America, and 7.8% from North America. In terms of arrival in the United States, 33.6% were immigrants, 41.1% as refugees, 11.2% asylees, and 11.2% other category. In terms of the age group, the mean age, the average age of study participants was 39.46 years. Gender distribution, as you can see here, 55% men, 44% women. In terms of education, this was a really interesting sample where 32% of the community sample at least had a bachelor's degree. In terms of the quantitative measures, we tried to capture six different dimensions of integration. So you'll hear me talk about multi-dimensional integration and each is measured with two or four survey questions. There were psychological integration that really looks into these cognitive, mental aspects of integration. Economic integration um, refers to the process of combining different economies, right? Uh, political in, um, integration, social integration, linguistic integration, um, Navigational integration, which is this ability to navigate or find one's way within a particular context. And so we envision this sense of belonging, sort of this emotional integration, and that's missing from the larger integration conversation. So when we looked at these skills, these were a very good measure, as the data showed, and normally if it's point, the reliability is 0.7 and above, it's normally considered a good measure. So this is just showing that all of these um, measures that were used quantitatively had good reliability. Qualitatively, all the focus group discussions at the town hall events were audio recorded, transcribed verbatim, we used interpreters, different languages. There were volunteers from the community that also helped to interpret these focus group discussions. And it, it really created for a very good community conversation. Um, we use a focus group guide here, asking questions around the meaning of belonging. What are some of the facilitators of belonging? What should be the policy recommendations? Right? So just created a lot of conversation on that issue. Virtual focus group discussions with stakeholders. And so when you think about stakeholders, 
It can be anybody, right? It defined as any group or individual. And we looked at seven key domains of stakeholders, the public, the policymakers, the research community, practitioners and professionals, health and human service providers, civil society organizations and businesses, and these were the rep representation um, from the stakeholder groups. Again, because young people are often left out of these conversations, it was important to create a platform for young people to have the opportunity to represent themselves, tell their own story, and we used photo voice, which really is this um, method to where young people take pictures of their own realities and then they follow through with their small group reflections. And so by utilizing these photographs taken and selected by participants, uh, we were able to reflect upon and explore the reasons, emotions, and experiences that have guided their chosen images. And it's been a, a very strong method for participatory processes. And 16 participants were there um, among our young people. 62% were 18 years and above. 37.5% were between 15 and 17 years. We did have a majority female representation with an overwhelming 81.3% female and 18.8% male participants. 75% of our youth participants were attending high school at the time of data collection and 25% were attending college. There were three virtual sessions, each session, um, anywhere from 60 to 90 minutes for a session. And we used a focus group guide um, talking about where you feel you belong in Columbus. Um, what about this space or place makes you feel like you belong? What about a photo representing a um, place that you feel like you don't belong, right? So these were some of the um, focus group guide. And so throughout the process, it was interesting that the young people wanted to delve more into some of the other things. So it became a very participatory process in how we facilitated the focus group discussions. So there are two key things that I want to mention. Um, photo voice really is about voicing our individual and collective experience. So we use these method called a photo where they describe their photo, they um, tell us what's happening in the photo, and they had to submit this online first with their, within their own reflection. And then we brought that into a photo elicitation process and used this method called showed that then try to garner these collective experiences among the young people. These were the three different methodology. Um, and now when it comes to data analysis, for the community survey, right, um, we did univariate analysis, bivariate analysis, which sort of involves analysis of two variables to really see if there is a relationship between these variables and then a multivariate analysis, which is multiple various looking at simultaneously. And we were very interested in those three things, right? Integration, sense of belonging, and quality of life. Um, in terms of qualitative data analysis framework, we used a framework analysis, which is a very systematic and flexible approach to data analysis. Um, and this method uh, was particularly used because we aimed to explore specific research questions within our data. Um, and there were key phases used for analysis. In the first phase, we first familiarized ourselves with the data by reading and rereading all the transcripts and notes um, within a six-person research team. We then identified a framework for coding um, um, that was, uh, consisted of a set of categories, including meaning of belonging, barriers to sense of belonging, facilitators to sense of belonging, and community recommendations that were relevant to the research question and objectives. We then systematically applied the coding framework to index the data, categorize segments of text um, according to these defined categories, and um, then we use this in vivo software to manage and organize the coding process. And then when it came to data charting phase, data um, that were coded under each theme or category were then organized into matrices. So um, if we have time, we also wanted to decompose that and how, what things came up across the focus groups, right? So there was a very intense data analysis process that went through. And then in the third, um, in the uh, fourth phase, we summarized the findings using quotes or experts because that is valuable. The verbatim responses are the real data. 
um, that hold a lot of values and lived experiences, um, and which we will be presenting today. So when it came to photo voice data analysis, um, we used a four-step approach to this. Um, in the first step, we looked at the patterns of visual data to examine different domains of the pictures. Um, we looked for relationships, environments, abstractions um, that would bring in light the symbolic meaning um, to young people's experiences. Um, and second, it was important to analyze the responses from the participants to describe how they used photography to respond to the prompts given to them. And we wanted our young people to interpret the photographs that they took. And so their narrations that were in textual descriptions provided the descriptions of these photographs. Um, and that was that individual experience. Um, and in order to derive a shared meaning, we used visual elicitation, which I mentioned before. And we created a focus group discussion and used that interaction again among the young people to gather that collective experience. And we finally brought the image individual and collective experience gathered from these three sessions and used a thematic analysis to map the concepts collaboratively. And after that, we also met with the young people later to share the findings, making sure that we were interpreting everything appropriately and accurately. Now let's get to the findings. In terms of the quantitative findings, six domains of integration. Across these six domains of integration, you will see that um, linguistic integration, economic integration, psychological integration had the highest average scores. 57.8% okay? of participants had a high level of multidimensional integration. So multidimensional is really averaging all of these six domains of integration. 42% had a lower level of multidimensional integration. 65% had a higher sense of belonging. 35% of the participants had a lower sense of belonging, which is good, right? It's, it's good. But when it came to perceived quality of life, 52% had a lower quality of life. 48% had high quality of life. So now we were interested to see what's going on with the lower integration and higher integration groups. So we ran t-test t -test, and compared, and, and so the result here is showing that compared to those in the low integration group, sense of belonging was significant higher for those in the high integration group. Compared to those in the low integration group, quality of life was significantly higher for those in the high integration group. Intuitively, this makes sense, right? So when it came to looking at now correlations, which is numerically measuring how these variables are closely related to each other, we see that there was a moderate positive correlation between integration and sense of belonging. And this was statistically significant, um, which means that higher levels of multidimensional integration are associated with higher sense of belonging. So when we say something is statistically significant, we mean that it's probably just not luck. It's a real result that we can trust based on the statistical estimates. Okay. And we also found there was a weak positive correlation between multidimensional integration and quality of life, uh, which means that higher levels of integration with, is associated with higher subjective well-being or quality of life. Um, but when we looked at sense of belonging, the correlations indicated a very weak positive correlation between sense of belonging and quality of life, and that was not statistically significant, which now is interesting, which then led us to explore this dynamic more. And this dynamic, though, is very interesting, especially for policy interventions. Right, understanding the moderating role of sense of belonging can inform policymakers and practitioners about where to focus interventions. For example, if sense of belonging is significantly, um, if it significantly moderates the integration, um, well-being, integration and quality of life relationship, then programs aiming to improve sense of belonging could be crucial to enhancing quality of life. And so we sort of looked at these 
relationship statistically, and I'll try to explain, I'll do my best to explain this. So here, the numbers, what it is showing, right? What it is saying is higher level of integration is associated with lower quality of life. When integration is higher, the quality of life decreases. So higher sense of belonging is also associated with co of lower quality of life, right? So here what we find is instead of the integration of quality and um, quality of life, as well as belonging and quality of life, moving in the same direction, which is higher as we had anticipated, they move in opposite direction, right? And these findings really challenge these conventional wisdom and, and contradicts this common intuition or prevailing theories. And that's why we call it the immigrant integration paradox, right? So, then, then this is interesting. So then we looked at moderation analysis and showed a significant moderating effect of belonging on the association between integration and quality of life. And a moderating variable normally is this, like a switch or a dial that changes the strength or direction um, of the relationship between two or other variables. So it's almost like an influencer that affects how two things are related to each other. So we call this a significant interaction effect in statistics that the impact of one factor, which is the integration, changes based on another factor, which is belonging being there. So here, adding these, adding sense of belonging to the integration and quality of life dynamic, it changed to a positive direction and that was statistically significant. Quality of life increased when belonging was added to integration and quality, quality of life dynamic, which, may, which means that quality of uh, belonging is very important to sense of integration, right? Um, sense of belonging is, uh, is important to the integration process. So we then wanted to decompose this, right? So people have higher and lower levels of belonging. We saw that. And now it's saying if we put belonging in integration, you get a higher quality of life. So what is really happening here? What happens to lower or medium or higher sense of belonging? So when we decompose that, it indicated that the relationship between integration and quality of life changed at different levels of sense of belonging, right? Like this is what the graph is showing. showing. So the low sense of belonging, when people have a low sense of belonging, the effect of feeling integrated on their quality of life is not significant. This means that even if they feel more integrated into the community, it does not necessarily improve their quality of life. They might still feel disconnected or unsupported, and this lack of belonging really cancels out the positive effects of integration. For people with medium sense of belonging, feeling integrated does have a positive impact on their quality of life. And this effect is significant, as it shows here, indicating that as people feel more integrated, their quality of life improves. But this, but this improvement is more noticeable when they already have the sense of belonging. When people have a high sense of belonging, the positive effect of feeling integrated on their quality of life is very strong and highly significant. This means that for these individuals, feeling integrated in the, into the community greatly enhances their quality of life. So the combination of high integration and high belonging creates the best outcomes. So here is the direct implication for policies and programs. The focus really should be on creating that sense of belonging. Higher belonging is positively linked with higher integration and qu higher quality of life. Again, what does this really mean, right? So the findings, the quantitative findings really reveal the immigrant integration paradox, again, that reflects the intricate experiences of immigrants within their host communities. Um, we call this a paradox as it is a seemingly self-contradictory situation that in defies intuition, right? And paradoxes often reveal deeper truths or it highlights inconsistencies in reasoning. And so on one hand, immigrants you know, bring these wealth of skills and talents and cultural diversity that enriches the socioeconomic landscape. 
Um, the other hand, however, despite these contributions, they often encounter significant barriers, right? And so this paradox underscores the stark disparity between immigrants' potential to, uh, to enhance their host communities and the systemic hurdles they confront in realizing their potential. But interestingly, when we look at both feeling integrated and having a sense of belonging together, we see that having a strong sense of belonging can actually make up for not feeling fully integrated, right? So if, in other words, even if someone doesn't feel fully settled or involved in the community, just feeling like they can still boost, feeling like they belong can still boost their quality of life. So then what does it mean for our community? Um, it means that to help improve everyone's quality of life, we should focus not just on helping people integrate, like through jobs and language skills, but also making sure that everyone feels they belong. Now moving on to the qualitative findings. And I should mention that um, with this, you know, the quantitative results were interesting, but again, addressing this immigrant integration paradox really necessitates the implementation of comprehensive policies and initiatives that promote equity, right? And policies and programs should aim to foster a strong sense of belonging within the community. Moving on to qualitative findings, um, now that we've understood the crucial rule of belonging, um, how is the qualitative data from our community and stakeholders explaining this? Um, you know, we're presenting five key themes today that unravel belonging in everyday experiences. Participants really discussed uh, the emotional, psychological, social, economic, all of these different dimensions. They emphasize the cultural linguistic commonalities. Um, and belonging really is not just surviving, but thriving. Right? These were rampant across all the focus group, both within the community and the stakeholders. Labor market inequities and untapped potential of immigrants and refugees. Immigrants and refugees arrive in Columbus with numerous professions and skills, um, with this enthusiasm to work and contribute to the labor market, but they face significant challenges in accessing the labor market due to language barriers. Uh, moreover, even having these credentials and education, participants shared how they often encounter barriers preventing them from working in the respective fields due to non-recognition of their qualifications. And so these kind of situations forces them to start over and undergo very time-consuming processes to have their qualifications recognized. And in some cases, immigrants are required to even pass uh, English proficiency tests or undergo unnecessary prerequisites. Um, and these quotes really illustrate, the quotes that you see here, it really illustrate the frustration and disillusionment that arise from being excluded from these professional opportunities that really hinder their ability to contribute meaningfully to society and highlights these barriers that immigrants face in fully utilizing their skills. Um, this is not a practice that limits their professional growth, but also deprives society of their um, diverse talents and contribution. That's why the potential is still remains very untapped. Navigating everyday discrimination and social exclusion. So discrimination and feeling socially excluded was a major block. And all of these qualitative quotes that you see here, um, it really is talking about sharing these different ways they have experienced this discrimination because of the different individual and social characteristics. Um, they pointed out how they are and, and always reminded them of being different. The discussion highlighted several barriers hindering sense of belonging among immigrant and refugee populations and creating this one size fits all approach solutions greatly hinders sense of belonging. Uh, participants highlighted inequities in many areas and despite efforts to expand bilingual, multilingual services, there's disparities in access that, is, uh, that remains that impacts various aspects of daily life such as navigating legal processes accessing healthcare, and that there is a need for culturally responsive interpretation services, particularly in fields like healthcare and legal services. These can really pose a lot of challenges that hinder sense of belonging. 
In terms of facilitators, there were several factors that enabled a sense of belonging. Inclusive spaces, right? The findings from the focus group discussions reiterated the crucial role of inclusive spaces. Um, and they identified spaces as parks, libraries, community centers for social events, cultural spaces, places of worship, restaurants, universities, and schools. And um, data emphasized the crucial role of local organizations, including nonprofit organizations, particularly community-based ethnic organizations led by immigrants and refugees, faith-based organizations in promoting this sense of belonging. When it comes to the visual data, there were different patterns that we found. So there was, when, what was interesting was this distinction between place and space. And so place refers to this location that has sense of identity, meaning or significance attached to it, and it's often associated with human experience. Um, and places are sort of these imbued with social, cultural, and historical attributes and in the photo voice project, we found young people coined places such as places of worship, cultural stores, including grocery stores, home, backyard, park, neighborhoods as places, festivals and events, and also community centers. Spaces were the physical dimensions right the void that just exists between objects, and the photo voice participants. Um, really identified cafeteria, hospitals, library, bookstore, auditoriums as these spaces that are just defined by their physical dimensions. Um, but I do want to mention that spaces can become meaningful when it is transformed into a place through human perception, through human interaction, and feelings of sense of belonging. Um, the photo voice data again, has implications for placemaking initiatives, which really is this process of creating and improving public spaces, right? So, um, and then the third pattern that we saw were abstractions that uh, really refers to the process of simplifying. It can be abstract, but holds some sort of meanings. And here, there were expressive abstraction, semi-abstraction, symbolic abstraction in, in many sort of patterns. And expressive abstractions were basically Young people were really showing these um, pictures uh, in a subjective or more emotional manner, focusing more on the conveying feelings of ideas rather than accurate representations. So it was sort of this emotional representation. Semi-abstraction were creating a balance between what is real and what is um, abstracts. For example, they, talk, they showed pictures of books in talking about silencing of language. Um, there was symbolic interaction, there was um, abstraction that was using symbols of visual metaphors, and it was cultural symbols, and it was you know, pictures of a lunch, school lunch, um, diversity inclusion. And in this picture itself, the Spring Fling event, it's showing diversity and inclusion through this picture. So from the visual data, um, places of belonging in Columbus, religious freedom and access to religious spaces came up. Cultural hub, you know, the sad picture of a Saraga International Grocery Store, um, and the importance of diverse, inclusive environments in fostering a sense of belonging. Um, you know, the, the person who took this picture talked about feeling a sense of unity and connection in a place where people from various backgrounds uh, provide opportunities. Sense of home. And here, the importance of familial relationship and sense of home in fostering belonging. So when we think about policies and programs, are there family-based policies that could probably be put more investment in or, or put more effort in that could potentially create that sense of belonging among young people? Diversity and inclusion as a facilitator of belonging. And this theme really caps, encapsulates that this, the young person's experience of feeling a sense of belonging at Columbus State University highlighting the importance of inclusivity and diversity in creating welcoming environment for students. And it's suggesting that a strong sense of belonging, particularly during this um, Spring Fling event, was the celebration of diversity. 
This quote here encapsulates how something as seemingly small as a name on a bookmark can have a profound effect on personal identity and community inclusion, emphasizing again the importance of representation in shaping positive experiences and connection within a society. Self-expression and cultural identity as a facilitator to belonging. Young people also looked at access to resources as something that fosters sense of belonging, suggesting that spaces like bookstores serve as a valuable hub of information and cultural exploration. Same with the, with the Homework Help Center. Here the young person is underscoring the importance of Homework Help Centers in fostering a sense of belonging and support for students within their communities. Barriers to representation were lack of representation and inclusion. It's a pe picture of a table tennis court. The person talks about, um, about the experience of not belonging when someone feels like they are part of a minority group in a predominantly homogeneous environment. And here, from this quote, we can learn about the experience of not belonging when an individual's dietary preferences or restrictions are not accommodated in a communal setting, such as a school cafeteria, and this was a big part of that discussion. Hospital setting, not a place where they feel belong because they feel they're not feeling respected and values. And we can learn that um, experience of not belonging when an individual feels uncomfortable or out of place in a specific environment, such as a hospital setting. And here, um, the young person is talking about the impact of social barriers and youth's sense of belonging in a school environment, um, that more needs to be done to create that cross-cultural learning. Lack of transportation, and here it's highlighting issues related to transportation accessibility for students, particularly um, regarding after-school activities and school bus stops. The necessity for young people to take on adult responsibilities at home due to lack of resources. And so they talked about this adultification and resource inaccessibility. And we've seen across in our communities, children taking parentified roles. But it was interesting how the young people really related to the systemic factors of resource inaccessibility. When they were asked to reimagine their Columbus, and this gets very exciting, they talked about the cultural harmony and sense of belonging. They reimagined Columbus, the power of cultural festivals and programs in fostering this sense of belonging. The vision for a reimagined Columbus, one of inclusivity, accessibility, sustainability, on creating this robust public transportation system that spans all city areas like um, and suburbs, um, ensuring reliable service, um, bike lanes, pedestrian walkways that would enhance mobility. A desire for improved infrastructure in Columbus, specifically focusing on sidewalks and transportation. And again, reimagining security and belonging in, inclusive, um, in, belonging in, in, in Columbus, where they want to see Columbus as a safe heaven, uh, where young people can feel safe. So when we move on to community recommendations, um, and I'm going fast, but I'll be happy to take any questions that you have, may have later. The first recommendation, these are community grounded recommendations, intentional civic participation, um, emphasizing the need for empowerment and inclusion of immigrant and refugees in civic and political processes, advocating for policies that actively incorporate their voices. Um, they believe that Columbus can really set a new standard for inclusivity by fostering an environment where diverse perspectives are valued, and they have, and that they have the platform um, and support to engage meaningfully. Representation is crucial for fostering connections and ensuring that all voices are heard, having diverse and inclusive representations at all level of decision making. Um, and investing in immigrant leadership is also vital, and that is also increasing representation, um, particularly immigrant leaders, particularly who are leading community-based ethnic organizations, bring unique perspectives, experiences, and solutions that can address diverse community needs and drive social and economic growth. So providing opportunities for leadership development, mentorship, and access to resources were some of those recommendations. 
Refugees and immigrants are also very eager to participate in the democratic process, but, they're often face, but they often face barriers such as limited access to information. So they stress the importance of providing essential resources and support to help these individuals navigate the voting process, including facilitating voter registration, providing information about elections, but making the electoral process more accessible and inclusive for immigrants. The voices can be heard and valued in our democratic system. And there were participants also highlighted the need for local groups in Columbus to provide um, resources and assistance to immigrants, especially regarding voter registration and understanding the voter process. This was one of the major recommendations that came from the community is envisioning, um, the env en envision establishing an immigrant center in Columbus and that this center would serve as a crucial hub for individuals from diverse backgrounds to come together, to share their experiences, provide mutual support, um, and beyond being a gathering space, the Immigrant Center would serve as a resource hub, um, disseminating information and resources effectively, ensuring that they can access and utilize them, um, and by also providing a platform for communication with individuals in higher positions. The center would facilitate networking and access to job opportunities. Um, the establishment of this immigrant center can align with the city's commitment um, to being a welcoming and inclusive home for all residents. Participants strongly recommended enhancing K through 12 curriculum by incorporating comprehensive cultural, historic, and religious education that reflects the backgrounds and experiences of immigrants. Again, celebration of culture, emphasizing the importance of cultural recognition and representation. But celebration of culture also meant culturally responsive services, um, that celebrating culture through these culturally responsive services and training means actively integrating cultural awareness, respect, and sensitivity into all aspects of service delivery and organizational operations. The community identified several key areas to enhance the sense of belonging and integration, emphasizing the importance of deliberate investment in um, immigrant community to restore their sense of belonging. Um, they stressed the need for resources to be directed towards English as second language education, particularly for younger generations and women. They highlighted the importance of schools being well informed about immigrant communities' histories and beliefs. Um, other recommendations around affordable housing, and the findings also highlighted the pressing need for improved coordination and collaboration within their service delivery system. Um, tackling funding obstacles through cross-agency partnership, some of the funding inequities that are, um, that are there, uh, including restrictive funding practices. Expansion of the built environment, again, robust public transportation system that spans across cities and suburbs, dedicated bike lanes, um, expanding the built environment involves creating a more comprehensive and inclusive urban infrastructure. The report will be forthcoming and it will be available on the www.immigrantmakecolumbus.com website. Um, and I just want to, our research team, um, want to thank them. Uh, Dr. Mengo is here, Shambika is here, Chuma is here. Please just wave maybe. Let people see you. Thank you so much. Kaltum is here as well. Thank you, Kaltum. The students were phenomenal. Our community engagement office, thank you so much. We could not have done this without you. I really want to thank them. Um, the advisory committee, thank you so much. And the office of council member, um, thank you so much um, for all of this. And I also want to thank Jennifer Walton, who was initially involved in all of the graphic design process. Acknowledgement to our colleagues at the College of Social Work at Louisiana State University, also at the, Ohio, um, at the Arizona State University, who provided all this support and consultation for us. Also want to thank the Office of Outreach and Engagement as they recognized the Immigrant Make Columbus Project as one of Ohio State's um, 2024 Program of Excellence in Engaged Scholarship, so thank you. And a tribute to all the research participants whose invaluable contributions made this study possible. Their willingness to share their time, experience, and insights has greatly enriched our understanding 
we extend appreciation to all participants in this research effort, including all the human service um, providers, grassroots community leaders from ethnic organizations, key informants and community members, and young people across the new American population. Thank you so much. This collaborative contribution are really central um, to the focus of this research, and we hope we have presented your insights accurately. And with that, I can open it up with, for a few questions, looking at the time, maybe one or two questions. Yes. Um, Dr. Mengo, maybe we can give the microphone. Hi, um, great presentation. For the quantitative pieces for quality of life and um, sense of belonging, uh, what types of questions were those? Was it a validated scale? Was it a scale you all created and then validated through the qualitative pieces? Can you just go into that for um, the audience? Absolutely, thank you for that question. All the quantitative measures that we use are all validated scale. For the sense of belonging, we used a scale called challenge sense of belonging that had four item questions that talked about their sense of connection. That was a sense of belonging. It had been used in Germany um, and other places with other immigrant and refugee populations and we wanted to test it out here in Columbus, which provided a very good reliability as well. Um, for quality of life, we used um, the subjective well-being scale which is a very validated uh, scale that talks about people's perceived um, well-being and quality of life measure. And I'll be happy to provide um, more details on that later to you. Thank you for that question. I probably could take one more question and we can head to the panel. Cecilia in the front. Uh, my name is Michael Greenman. I'm a resident of Northern Columbus and a member of the One ID Columbus Coalition, which has been attempting for some years to obtain a, a photo ID, legal photo ID for people who are undocumented. Uh, the report reported that 22.3% of the foreign born population is undocumented, or about 41,000 people. And I'm curious to know how people who are undocumented, which means they have no means to go into an office building or a school or a hospital without the identification, are able to incorporate themselves into the community without such identification. That's a really good question. And I think I'll just have to come back to the community on that. Um, in our study, there were a lot of legal retaliation and fears that came out um, in terms of some of the barriers of um, belonging. But apart from that, there were not much discussion that happened. But I think you bring a very valid and very important issue that probably needs to be explored further. Thank you. Thank you. All right, I will be available. Um, for any other questions afterward. Um, the full report will be out very soon. We are thinking mid-July. And our emails are there. If you have any other questions, we'll be happy to answer them or clarify anything. Uh, but for now, we'll switch to our panel discussion. And I will um, hand it over to Dr. Dorothy Hassan, who is going to moderate the community panel discussion. Thank you very much. <laughs>
Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for spending your evening with us. I um, have a teacher voice that I use with this microphone, so I'm going to be uh, significantly louder and expect the same from all of you. Uh, this is the part where we really, really want to engage and again, call on you to hear your voice. And I encourage you to applaud more um, and snap fingers and whatever, but this is the part where we really, really get involved and, and feel our sense of community in this way. So we are welcoming some superstars to the panel. And at this time, I think, uh, yep, we're going to, we're gonna raise it because we, we wanted them to think that they were standing the whole time, but now the gig is up, we will supply seating here. Ibrahim Aso, we are happy to welcome him to the panel this evening. Ibrahima served as a member on the Community Advisory Board for the Immigrants Make Columbus Pro uh, Project. We welcome Susmeda Adikhari. Did I, how, how well did I say that from zero to 10? Nine, yes, I'll take it. Thank you, sweetheart, welcome. Melina Figueroa, a seven. A six. <laughs> Don't worry, everyone else will have the, the, the opportunity to say their name properly. And Dr. Bartholomew, uh, Bartholomew Shepkong. I think we're gonna use this window. Okay, yeah, I'm gonna do this. All right, so can we, do we change, can we change lighting or can everyone see them well? <laughs> Either way, can we t first take a few moments for each of you to share your name and we agreed your name and there we go. Spotlight on our superstars, thank you. Your name, what you do in the community, and how you were involved in this project in particular. So the project started. Oh, this is on. Okay, there you go. Um, so my name is Ibrahim Asso. Um, currently, I am a, a network director for the United Way of Central Iowa Success by Third Grade uh, movement um, across Franklin County, making sure that all of our babies are uh, on a pathway to success by the time they leave third grade. Um, in my role, um, uh, as proud of I am about it, is serving as uh, a member of the advisory board or committee. Hello, good evening. Um, my name is Sismina Adikari, and I am a student at the Ohio State University, and I'm majoring in computer science. For this project, I was a participant in the photo voice section. I just noticed we have four microphones and <laughs> want to stay together. Um, my name is Melina Cortez Figueroa and I am an assessment specialist. Um, then, but that's my job. And as I volunteer as an Spanish uh, for Spanish speaking um, communities as an interpreter. Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is uh, Bath Shepcom. I am a social entrepreneur. Uh, a college professor uh, where I teach uh, cultural diversity and sociology at the Central Ohio Technical College. And also, I am the co founder of the Columbus African Festival. And uh, I'm going to use this opportunity <laughs> to invite each and every one of you uh, July 27th, July 27th, 28th at the Genoa Park for the Columbus African Festival. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. Okay, for, so for this first question, I'd like to hear from each of you. Could you share your perspectives on the findings of the study? And were there any results that particularly shocked you or disappointed you? So let's hear from everyone, please. Uh, 
Not as much surprised because I, I think, as uh, Dr. Raji had mentioned in the findings, that there were foundational studies that have been done um, uh, that are very well documented around the same issues. And I think, as far as when it comes to the sense of belonging, um, I think this is the one study that really honed in more on it uh, to be able to find that intersection with quality of life. Um, but I think it's one thing that was validated uh, that we've known for a while that. Uh, I experience as uh, as an immigrant growing up in Columbus is the adultification of uh, of young kids because of that lack or gap of resources, um, especially more local ones that maybe some parents with limited English uh, either don't have access to or are less likely to seek out. Um, and so that one person that is either going to be uh, translating letters. Um, looking at uh, utility bills and, and bringing and translating what their own report cards say, as is my experience, is going to be that nine, ten year old um, at home. So I think that was something that, that came out of that study. And this, and this study, I'm sorry, that um, I, I was particularly interested in diving further into as we move forward. So, um, in my perspective, because as a young person, my parents did immigrate to the US, and I believe that the discussion didn't quite surprise me because I experienced what, as you said, um, the identification because I would always take my parents to hospitals, um, translate for them, and literally like translate the bills too. So when you said that, I was like, that really clicked. And adding to the discussion, I found really interesting and like it was really cool that a sense of belonging really fostered like a better quality of life because when I see my parents, I was like everywhere they go, they don't really feel a sense of belonging because of the language barriers and I really see that to improve later on. Thank you. Um, I agree with her. not surprised about the, the results because I, I agree with what they sh were showing that there's a, this sense of belonging is crucial to form social ties to um, bring the community together and also to avoid some kind of segregation too between the communities. Yeah, for, for me, I it's it's just like any every, every everyone here. It's, it's not a surprise to me, but at the same time, what I found very interesting was uh, um, those that have a high sense of belonging tend to have uh, a lower uh, uh, quality of life. So it begs the question: uh, sitting down and listening, and I started asking myself some fundamental questions in my head. Should we just go ahead and create our own enclaves whereby we will have a sense of belonging? Or uh, is integration, you know, uh, really helping? Mm. You know, so those are some of the questions that kept coming. And again, um, it's, it's, it's very interesting, you know, to, to see that even though you have a high sense of belonging, but at the same time, your quality of life is a little bit low. And, uh, at the same time, it, 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 it helps us believe that or think that people that are like immigrants here, that even though they have a sense of belonging, they're still struggling, you know, um, in terms of maybe jobs, you know, and, and that, that can lead to their lower uh, uh, quality of life. Okay. Thank you. Uh, what I hear all of you saying again is just a reminder of what Dr. Arati was saying about the paradox, is that the, f the research findings give us enough fuel to get back to the table. Because there's something that's there that we should, that, that's pushing us to pull away from what people conventionally thought was the success quotation for immigrants. So thank you. 
Which, what policy changes do you believe are necessary at the local or national level to address the issues highlighted by this study? And how can policymakers use this research to inform their decisions? So now is the time. Policy workers, uh, council, city, state, what is it that we want to share with them? What would you say? Um, I am glad the city council member is here. So um, <laughs> the first, the first thing I will, I will say to all the policymakers, uh, those that are here, it's uh, maybe the first thing that we can do. I know maybe that has been done or is in the works, but maybe find a way of creating some kind of uh, local business incubators. For and, and, and support and support network for some of these that will help these immigrants and refugees to start and grow their businesses because when you look at it, most of them are, are entrepreneurs, you know. So uh, that might also help them have this sense of belonging that we are talking about, and at the same time, uh, partner with local uh, empo employers to provide job training and, 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 and placement programs for, for immigrants. Because uh, I was also no audio. looking at one of the findings, and uh, someone with a, with, a, with a bachelor's degree was asked to go and, and, and even though it was funny, but they said his English is not good and, and you need to go and be a dishwasher. And his question was, what am I going to do? Talk to the dishes? Mm -hmm. You know? Yeah. So the fact is, creating all these uh, avenues will definitely help immigrants and refugees. Um, to add something to the discussion, uh, I recently went to Colorado and I'm initially from Colorado, so looking back at the place we lived, there were a lot of public transportation, bike lanes, and pedestrian walkways like literally everywhere. So I would like to see more of that in our central Ohio areas, and I thought that was or like more modes of transportation other than driving because that will really help people, immigrants that just move to not just have like requirement to have like a car. Um, I think the things like um, the increased sidewalks, maybe um, with the revolution around expanding trails and, and all of that as well as um, what Smart Columbus is working on. Uh, with bus rapid transit. I think all those are getting us to there as, as a modern city should. Um, I think, uh, Dr. Zan, two things that I, I want to add is, as far as policy go um, is one, I think we're looking and in, in really reinvigorating the conversation around how do we get so many of our engineers, our doctors, um, our aviation pilots, all these people with advanced degrees that could contribute so much to the talent pool and economy of not just Columbus but Ohio, out from just not just not just driving Lyft or working at limited brands. Like, how do we do that? How do we? It's it's an economic proposition, um, and I think policymakers. The more we talk about it, hopefully, uh, the more we build awareness around the amount of talent um, and economic output that we are missing out as an entire community from. Uh, from these from these professionals um, uh, because it's, it's a waste of it's brain, brain drain honestly that's what we're doing um, and I think another thing uh, is really and this was identified in uh, in the findings that Dr. Rati mentioned I think many of the the first uh, point of contact whenever an immigrant or refugee comes here um, the, in the case of refugees with their resettlement agencies but when it comes to immigrants um, the that community organization that, that probably fictive or in name only, sometimes this organization that has like a few people in it um, to where that's, the, that's your first point of contact of where do people live, how do I sign my kids up for school, where are the English classes at, how do I get all these basic necessities um, that sometimes uh, the, the organizations, though they do great work and they get a ton of money from city and county, those people fall through their cracks. Um, and I think so much of the funding structure that makes up these human service organizations, um, we can revisit to see how we can further invest in those local community organizations that 
sometimes get no funding, and yet everyone is going to them to be able to do the impossible. Um, and I think at times they have a hard time connecting with the other, um, I don't want to say usual suspect organizations, but those that really gobble up um, some of those funds. And so I, I think that, that is a conversation that um, only at the policy level we could have to see how, not how we share the love, but how you reprioritize to where the need actually is. Audio off, but I'm okay. Um, that's actually a great segue into our next question. And before that, I wanted to again take a very public opportunity to thank Ken Councilwoman for leading this research and for not for leading the research, for leading the effort uh, for this research <laughs> and for actually putting purpose to action because we have many of our policymakers who are power and privilege, but this is purpose to action, taking lived experience and putting it to action, so we thank you. And with that, um, we're excited about the announcement of the Commission for on Immigrants and Refugee Affairs at City Council. <laughs> what do you want that commission to do? <laughs> Let's go. I think um, once this commission does come to life, um, thanks to the amazing champion that we have in Councilman yeah. Florida, um, I think one, one thing that I would like to see is start to, to manifest to some of these uh, yeah. solution-based um, research that we've already kind of done, including this, including the, um, uh, the, the welcoming plan. Uh, that our good friend Guadalupe Velasquez has worked on um, uh, a couple years ago. So I, I think we are, we are not um, uh, we are not starving for solutions. Um, I think it's it's about building coalitions around what can we start achieving together. Um, and I think with this commission, it also helped a a growing city with a fragmented series of populations really coalesce and come together. And I, I think um, that is really one of the biggest. The outcomes, whether intentional or not, that we'll probably see uh, with your leadership. Uh, with the commission, I I am most excited about that the the one factor that we talked about in the research is pulling away from that one size fits all. So having a commission that is dedicated to immigrant and refugee affairs means that there's this voice talking about these issues. Um, and it's not one size fits all. So that's what I am most excited about. Now we're on to the rewarding aspect of your involvement in this initiative and how it's influenced your perspective on the sense of belonging for immigrant communities in Columbus. So what does this research, what does this initiative mean to you and how it affects the communities in Ohio, in Central Ohio. One thing um, towards the end of the, the, the findings that I that kind of hit home for me was uh, really this idea of the need to belong everywhere rather than belonging somewhere. Um, because as we know, the different enclaves, different parts of the city. Like on the east side, I'm the east side guy, right? That's where that's where I was raised. Like that's, that's my side of town. I love it. I can tell you where everything is. The, the African supermarket on Livingston, the SD market on Refugee. Um, uh, the, the, my first. Not job. much more, because then we'll know where to find you. This is true. It's not where I'm ahead. Um, but I, I think um, so many people that I talk to about, there's something happening over there, or there's a resource on Cleveland. Some people will live and die by Cleveland Avenue. Other people will never set foot on Cleveland Avenue. Um, and they're all immigrants. And so looking at how do we belong everywhere, um, I think depends on one, like you said, some of the, some of the organic entrepreneurship that, um, how does the African supermarket on East Livingston have the capacity to expand into the North? Um, and how does their clientele, mostly Senegalese and Gambian, um, and other folks feel comfortable in other parts of the city? Um, instead of 
feeling some place, anchored in some place of the city, how do we, how do we make the whole city our home? Um, and I think that's, that's something that, that kind of stuck out to me um, as, as Dr. Raji was going through the findings. Uh, with this discussion, I feel like something that was really important was that sometimes it's just, it feels belonged if somebody just hears you. So I loved how a lot of different age groups were able to participate and we got to hear the voices of everybody throughout this finding. Well, for me, the most rewarding uh, thing was just to support the community, um, to get them the information they needed, to let them express themselves like about all of these issues in their language and to express how they can even improve like the communities and that was that was very rewarding for me i think and this this i think the spanish speaking community i will talk about because that's the most um uh, i talked uh, they they have a lot of like trust issues <laughs> and uh, that that is a big historical explanation that i will not <laughs> talk about now but I think because of that, they, these trust issues, um, they, they fear about expressing themselves about many topics, but they want to talk about them. So when they get someone that talk their language, they will feel more comfortable. So that was very rewarding to me, like to, to get that information from them and provide it to, to the study. Yeah, the rewarding aspect for me, uh, one, being part of the, 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 the committee has really helped me to realize that even though all of us are immigrants, or most of us are immigrants, uh, we have uh, similar struggles. Our struggles are the same. Uh, even though we come from different parts of the world, you know, uh, and, and, and the issues are unique, you know. So, and getting to, to, to know more about what is going on in different communities has been very, very rewarding for me. You guys are like giving me assist and I didn't even pay you and I'm not gonna pay you. So just another disclaimer, but that's exactly what I heard all of you say is what I'm most happy that we had the professionals from OSU do is put the language to what the communities are feeling. We talk about some of the similarities in the immigrant and refugee communities. We talked about safety and trust. And just from the work that I do in diversity, equity, inclusion, that's called psychological safety. So I thank again the professionals, Dr. Arati and her team, Dr. Mango, Dr. Uh, Nigeria, I don't have everyone's last name because I consider them friends. So now we're on this first name basis. But thank you to the College of Social Work at OSU for putting that voice in the literature. That is pivotal for those immigrant and refugee voices that are seldom heard to be written in print right there in the literature. Thank you again. As the findings reiterated, sense of belonging is needed not just to survive, but to thrive. How do you think the findings of this study will impact the sustainability of communities to grow and thrive beyond the immediate needs? I'm not ready. <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's a very academic question. Um, can Ibrahim, let me sit, I'm going to say it differently. So we have these research findings, and we talked about the now of it. And honestly, if, if I just use my personal bias, which we all have, a lot of those usual suspects of organizations, we, we and I put myself in that, we operate on the now. We cover the basic needs. We're always talking about the in immediate needs of immigrant and refugee families. What can we use from this research to take that immediacy and turn it from surviving to thriving? What do we have for families to thrive and not just survive? 
like what resources we have. What did you find in the research that, that changes it from this is what we need right now to this is what we can use from these research findings to 10 years from now be happier with the Columbus, with the Franklin County, with the central Ohio that we live in? Mm -hmm. So from the research that we found right now, I hope that in the future, Columbus has many more programs that would make it easier for immigrant families to understand and be more aware of the resources around them and be more aware of how they can use the resources because sometimes it's just like, even families, they don't know what resources they just have available. They're like, oh, I'm in a problem right now and let me just go find a solution to that right now. It's like talk to immediate people right, right in the moment. But I'd like, it to be more like, oh, how can I find the solution to this earlier, like have it ready on hand. And I would wish Columbus could do a better job of marketing the resources. Uh, one thing I'd like to add is during the discussions that we had during the photo voice Zoom meetings, was that in schools, uh, this was touched based on in the presentation, but there were not a lot of vegan and vegetarian options, and as a vegetarian myself, and from one other um, participant that tried to go to the school authorities and change the vegetarian vegan options so that they have more of them, that would be really helpful if we could have more options. Because sometimes you just go to school and I would just get the lunch time because what's the point since you have no options? and a more reliable transportation and a good job of marketing like where those transportation go would be also nice and helpful because you know like we know Columbus has public transportation but we don't do a really good job of like marketing and getting out there where all those transportation leads to and where all the bus routes are so that's what I would imagine Columbus to be like in the next 10 years. I'm gonna push just because it's rare that we get the audience of someone as astute as yourself. So if we were to increase the marketing and awareness of those things, how would we do it? Should we, do, should we increase our marketing through social media? Should we be going out to meet young people where they are? How, how should we do that? spread fast and I know a lot of parents are in Facebook <laughs> so like maybe encourage the youth so that their parents could follow like public pages like the Columbus City Council or the Reynoldsburg City Council and then once that is like once the parents are following those pages release the information there spread the word and yeah by doing that um, I, I think this is a very, very good and important um, research, but at the same time, for me, I don't think it should stop here. I, I believe that um, regular needs assessment is needed because who knows what will happen tomorrow. You know, um, I think it would be good to conduct a uh, regular needs assessment to better understand the needs and challenges faced by these immigrants. And, and, and at the same time, uh, once that is done, I also believe there is a need for more program evaluation, you know, um, whereby we can monitor and evaluate the progress, you know, of. Uh, uh, to ensure that uh, they are effective and also meeting the community needs. So it shouldn't stop today, tomorrow. I think it should be an ongoing process. Um, I just wanted to add that any project that will take into consideration these findings, I think it's going to be a successful project, a long-term um, successful project. Um, I think another way to communicate this information that we need um, are through also the through the community hubs too. Um, 
the organizations, um, so she said Facebook, I would say WhatsApp groups, that's very famous between the immigrants community, um, and, and, and be like, give this information, provide information, tell them how important, oh, can you? Hello. So yes, I, th I think providing the information, um, and if it's written as we were um, talking before, it will give some kind of validity there's a thing about, oh, this was made by the university, like this was a research made by the university. Give some kind of validity um, to the people, the people will start trusting um, who is providing the information, uh, they trust their leaders too, and so on, so yes. Uh, to add something to that, uh, when we're marketing, when we're marketing um, information and resources, depending on the group we are marketing to, it'd be really nice in Facebook or WhatsApp group to make sure that those are translated properly to the correct demographic. So they, are, they find it easier to read and understand what is actually happening. You know, one thing to, to just briefly add on to, uh, to what the amazing other panelists have said. Um, I think one thing that I'm taking away from this research and other ones really um, is taking an experience of, uh, of, a, of a group of people that may feel like they're kind of on an island and that needs special attention and that they are too different from what is considered normal and mainstream um, to actually humanizing an experience that uh, there is an immigrant of, with like four kids who also has a job to do, right? Um, they, they want the same things for themselves and their children as anyone that can live in uh, McNaughton or at Cleveland Avenue or anywhere else, right? And I, I think being able to understand and humanize um, those experiences uh, is very, very key to one, not just looking at them as, like you said, that they need basic needs in order to survive um, without knowing what that survival looks like, but how do you get them to thrive, um, and I think this allows, at least for for more of a cross section of, like schools need to be involved. It's not just social service organizations that provide X, Y, and Z for your immediate survival by the end of the week. And then how do we repeat that? But it's it's about how do we set you up for success? And that means bring all these other things together um, that everyone else in the community that's not an immigrant has access to. Um, that is how you set up people to not only integrate, but integrate at their own pace, give them a human experience that they can be proud of, that they've built themselves, um, uh, and to, to really take hold in that now their kids won't need those same organizational resources 10 years from now. Because that is what I hope, um, that everyone at Wedgwood eventually is not going to need all those life-saving interventions. At least that is the goal. That should be the goal. Um, and so hopefully this research allows us to, to not look in the immediate term, but to plan for the future for, uh, for that. Because there is going to be a generation that um, we would hope will not need to survive. Um, and I'm hoping we can, we can kind of build towards that with, with this body of research moving forward. A round of applause for our panelists, please. Thank you to each and every one, one of you. Uh, thank you again to everyone who is here tonight. Thank you for showing up in every version of that word, for showing up for the immigrant and refugee community in your participation, for showing up tonight and showing that the results of this research matter. Um, thank you in advance for looking at the full report when it comes out. Thank you in advance for being a very important part of the commission as it gets to work in January. Uh, thank you in advance for the work that you're going to continue to do um, on behalf of immigrants and refugee affairs in Columbus. Uh, you are the very best part of the city. So thank you again for being you. Closing remarks from Councilwoman. 
I just wanted to take a little privilege because I've gotten lots of love and accolade, but I have lots of partners in this work, and I know the crowd is a little thinner and we're over time, but I wanted to make sure that I pointed them out to all of you because they're also resources too. So in the back, Maria, if you could wave. And I think Alfred already headed out. Harrison, I think, might be in the back. Abdi was here. Uh, Amadi's from my team. These are all folks that work at the city. They are themselves either immigrants, uh, refugees, or first-generation Americans. And they are my partners in this work, um, both on the administra administration and the council side. And so if folks don't know them and you want to get involved in this work, um, you don't just have to reach out to me. I would love for you to, but also reach out to uh, my partners. But I wanted to make sure I would be remiss if I did not um, shout them out uh, today because many of them are leaving because they're actually going to other events today, <laughs> likely. So thank you all again. Get home safely, and there's more to come. <laughs>